It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 SIGCHI Lifetime Research Award Talk by none other than Brad Myers of CMU. So. Uh, the SIGCHI Lifetime Research Award is presented to individuals for outstanding contributions to the study of HCI. This award recognizes the very best, most fundamental, and influential research contributions. It's awarded, as the name indicates, for a lifetime of innovation and leadership and carries an honorarium of $5,000. The criteria for the award are cumulative contributions to the field, influence on the work of others, and development of new research directions. One of the benefits of the award, and it's really a benefit for us, the CHI community, is that we get to hear the award winner discuss their research in a format that's unconstrained by the narrow scope of a single paper talk. So that brings us to today's speaker. Dr. Brad A. Myers is a professor in the Human Computer Interaction Institute uh, in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. He's a member of the CHI Academy, a fellow of the IEEE and ACM, and winner of many best paper awards and three most influential paper awards. He has authored or edited 475 publications, including a spectacular 85 at CHI. I believe that's counting the two uh, papers that he has this year. And he's also one of a select few who has attended every CHI conference, and you can see documentation online of his extensive collection of CHI ribbons, <laughs> which many of you have seen already. Brad's MIT master's thesis was one of the earliest data visualization systems. While working for Perk Systems Corporation in the early 80s, Brad created Sapphire, one of the first commercial window managers with a number of features that later became widespread. For example, uh, all of you are familiar with the idea that your icons for, let's say, copying your know, directory from one place to another have a percent done indicator, and that's something that didn't make it into commercial systems until kind of, kind of late, and yet that was in Sapphire back when Brad created it. So his University of Toronto dissertation described Peridot, uh, a programming by demonstration system to specify the look uh, and behaviors of widgets without conventional programming. Um, I actually, when I talk about um, uh, programming by demonstration in my UI course, I, I cover Peridot because of its many neat features, including a really elegant way to deal with uh, inferring loops. At Carnegie, uh, He's created numerous toolkits, such as Garnet, with novel designs for objects, constraints, input and output handling, command objects, and interactive tools. And many of the innovations in the projects that he's going to be talking about um, have been adopted by later research and commercial systems. He's also an early innovator on innovative uses of handheld devices and systems such as Pebbles. And more recently, he's focused on using HCI techniques to improve programming for novice, expert, and end-user programmers. He's advised over 200 students, including PH, 16 PhD students, many of whom are also professors um, or at top research labs, and many of whom I actually see uh, in the audience. And from the titles of his many projects and his award talk title, I think you're going to see that Brad's research rocks. So it's now our pleasure to hear him speak. Well, thanks very much, Steve, and thanks everybody for coming. There's still some seats in the front if you want to sit down. So my talk title is indeed Ruby, Reminiscing About User Interfaces by Brad Over the Years. Uh, you can tell it's an acronym. Uh, it's uh, picked Ruby as the gemstone for this talk because it's actually the gemstone for the 40th anniversary. And this is approximately the 40th anniversary of when I started doing research in HCI. You should also be on the lookout throughout the talk for other acronyms and other gemstones, because it's kind of been a theme of my research group. I'm particularly honored and grateful to be given this award from the uh, SIGCHI organization and at the CHI conference, because this has always been my favorite conference. I've been to all of them back to the original 1982 predecessor for CHI. Um, I've kept all the ribbons from the early conferences. In fact, I've kept all the ribbons from every conference I've ever been to, <laughs> obviously getting a little out of hand. 
You may note that in 1989, Kai started using ribbons in addition to the badges, and this is a trend I've heartily embraced. Uh, you can tell that I really like ribbons, and I've even made a few of my own, like the garnet ribbon. Um, it's in the middle here. Uh, in Kai 2003, they switched to the boring horizontal ribbons, uh, but that way you can get more in a row. Uh, but we still stuck with the gaudy vertical ribbons, and you can probably find some uh, on the CMU people. We have this uh, great plaid ribbon that uh, are in many of our people around the conference. I guess I went a little overboard in 1990, thanks to Ben for this picture. Uh, but that's skipping ahead. I want to go right back to the beginning. Uh, so I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1957. So I just turned 60 uh, a month ago. This is really, uh, 2017 is a really big year for me, as you'll see. Um, I used to have a lot of hair. This was in the 70s, where everybody else did too. Skipping ahead in high school, I was a typical nerd. I became an, er an Eagle Scout. I was in the marching band. But finally, things got interesting when my high school got a first computer. Uh, this is actually a teletype. The computer was off somewhere else. Uh, the teletype connected to the remote computer by an amazing 110 baud, which, if you do the math, is almost 14 characters every second. <laughs> Instead of a screen, it had paper, and we programmed it in BASIC, uh, this example here. Somehow in my senior year in high school, I ended up with every other period off, which was pretty useless for going to college or anything like that. So I ended up uh, just going to the computer lab because no one else was. And I taught myself how to program in BASIC. And my final project uh, was uh, to create a gin rummy game, which I printed out on paper tape and I kept. Uh, so uh, I don't know how many other of the media that you guys use today you'll be able to have a picture of in 40 years. Things really kicked off when I went to MIT for college. Uh, my first research project in college was to create an animation, so it was a graphics project, of legs walking. And I had to do this in Fortran on punch cards, which I also kept. Uh, the graphics were displayed on a little bitty uh, vector screen. So I thought I would throw in some observations uh, uh, various places throughout the talk. And so far, hopefully you can see that Brad is really old, and also <laughs> that if you want to have stuff in 40 years, then it's a good idea to start keeping it now. In seven, 1977, I got to work at the MIT Architecture Machine Group, uh, which is the predecessor of the Media Lab, where our keynote speaker was from. Way back in the 70s, it was uh, a very innovative group. They did all sorts of interesting things. I worked on a project called the Spatial Data Management System, uh, which was a very important project. It was one of the first places with zoomable interfaces. Uh, it was one of the first places that had a calculator and a clock on the screen, which at the time seemed really silly. Uh, but now we you know, expect to have those kinds of things uh, all over the place. My project was to make an interactive editor for the graphic uh, objects that were on the screen. Uh, this is, uh, it was interactive, so it was probably my first HCI project. And that's why I uh, say, uh, been doing this for 40 years. Uh, the picture shows Chris Herrett, who was my advisor at the time, uh, doing this undergraduate research. MIT had a co-op program where computer science students got to go work at a company for three summers in the following fall and do their master's thesis with the company. And I was really uh, lucky to be in the first group that got to work at Xerox Park or Palo Alto Research Center, which obviously is a very important research lab um, for many of the uh, important research that came out uh, in the 80s and uh, again in the 90s. Uh, Park invented and refined many of the aspects of user interfaces that we now all take for granted, and also some of the hardware, uh, things like window managers, laser printing, IDEs, integrated development environments, icons, copy and paste, the ethernet, uh, ubiquitous computing, and many other uh, important innovations. I was fortunate to be able to be there while other people were doing all these important things. Uh, my first summer, I got to work in the small talk group, which was uh, all the original people. Uh, this is Alan Kay uh, at the upper right. Uh, I also worked with Dan Ingalls and Adele Goldberg and Ted Kaler, Bruce Horn. Uh, a story about Bruce is that he was actually a high school student at the time, 
and uh, he went on to be one of the original designers in the Macintosh team, and his name is on the inside of the original Mac. In all those movies about uh, the, the early Mac, he's, uh, there's some random actor playing him, uh, though they never give his name. And he actually came to CMU later and got a PhD. The project that I had wasn't quite as interesting. It was basically to create a network stack in Smalltalk, so it was really fun to learn Smalltalk. At the time, Smalltalk was so slow that when I implemented the network stack, you could actually see the packet going through the system. <laughs> Not very practical, but it, I really learned a lot. Here's a picture of me in front of the Alto computer, uh, which Xerox uh, had created to be the personal computer of the future, but no one knew anything about personal computing, so I sent this picture to my dad so he'd know what I was talking about. So here's the computer, and there's a mouse. Uh, here's me, I had to label that so my dad would know what I looked like. I hit the computers over here. In the, summer, in the following summer, in 78, I didn't do anything interesting, but the year after that, I got to do my master's thesis, which was uh, really a lot of fun, and I was advised by a lot of uh, important people, Dan Swinehart and Dave Reed, uh, but I also had help from other uh, important people at uh, Xerox at the time, John Warnock, who later went on to found Adobe, uh, Butler Lamson, Warren Teitelman, many other notable people. I implemented my thesis in the MESA programming language, which uh, had a bunch of really interesting features. My idea was uh, to help with debugging by drawing data structures. And I called this system INSENSE, which is neither an acronym nor a gemstone, because Park had rules about that kind of thing. Um, the idea was to draw the data structures in the way that people draw them on paper or on a blackboard. And so we used things like the uh, curved lines with arrowheads for, for pointers and uh, boxes for data structures. And you could also customize your display like making a clock face for a clock data structure. And the incense system was uh, credited with having a significant influence to um, lots of later visualization systems at Georgia Tech and at Brown, like Balsa and Pecan and Tango and Field and Garden, and then the system that I made at CMU, obviously, which was called MacNome. My very first conference paper was about the INSEN system, and it was at SIGGRAPH 1983. Um, back in those days when you wanted to make a paper, you had to actually print it out on paper and cut it with the scissors, and then paste it with actual glue which was really smelly. And then you had these enormous pieces of paper that you had to physically mail uh, back in. Uh, so uh, I remember that my presentation at SIGGRAPH 83 uh, was in a giant room like a hockey arena. And I was really nervous, so I wrote out what I was going to say and then I read it. Uh, but I don't think that really worked out very well. So uh, the moral is uh, it's not a good idea necessarily to write out your talk and just read it because then you sound really stilted and that's really not very good. After graduating, my next stop was at a startup company called uh, Three Rivers Computer Corporation, which eventually renamed itself to Perk Corporation. I was there from 1980 to 1983. The product was this uh, giant workstation, which was kind of modeled on the Alto. It cost $30,000 if you wanted to buy it. And the idea was that this would be used by engineers because it had the world's best display at the time, which was a high resolution black and white display. The, uh, I had a lot of fun doing projects like uh, different kinds of animations. Uh, the uh, little guy in the upper right is a perk debugger icon for a game called Perk Debugger, which was based on Pac-Man. Uh, this little guy ran around and ate the ghosts. Uh, turns out this game turned out to be surprisingly popular, and somebody re-implemented it for the sun years later, and there's still people who remember that game. Uh, but one of the most notable things that happened while I was at Perk was that I met my wife, Bernita, who's here today. <laughs> Getting married was je definitely the best decision I make. I highly recommend it. Um, <laughs> this summer, we're celebrating our 35th wedding anniversary, and uh, this is a picture from last year. The other notable thing I did at Perk was to create uh, one of the first commercial window managers, which was Sapphire. This was a gemstone and an acronym, screen allocation package, providing helpful icons of rectangular environments. 
Uh, th note that this was in 83, which was before the Macintosh came out. It was uh, around the same time as the Lisa, after the Star. Um, had a number of innovations that did not appear in those uh, window managers, but were in later ones, like the ability to change any property, move windows and so forth, using the keyboard uh, without using the mouse. Uh, collecting the icons together in this special icon window, uh, using progress bars in the icons as well as in the uh, title bars of the windows. And you've seen uh, lots of these features in later systems. My next stop was University of Toronto. Eventually it became clear that Perk was not going to make it big, and so it seemed like a great time to leave and get a PhD. And at the time, this is back in 82, 83, there really weren't that many people, places in the world where you could study HCI. And so uh, I was very fortunate to be able to get accepted to Toronto and work with Bill Buxton and Ron Becker, who were my advisors and uh, you know, key teachers of HCI in that uh, period. One of the first projects I did there was about percent done progress indicators or progress bars. I put progress bars in various systems, as you saw at PERC, as early as 1980, but they still were not very commonplace. Uh, on the Macintosh, you typically would have uh, an hourglass. The Macintosh had this little watch, if anybody remembers, which was static. Uh, at University of Toronto, we used this Buddha to try and instill patience in people. Um, so I did a study that uh, showed, not too surprisingly, that people actually preferred to have actual progress bars to show them the computer was working and how long they had. And this was uh, preferable, especially for tasks that were variable length. Um, and I showed a bunch of different graphical ways of showing the progress, including a bar and the uh, hourglass that fills up. And this uh, paper was credited with having popularized the more widespread use of progress bars. Another fun project I did was that Bill Buxton had long been talking about using two hands. He still talks about that today. And so I proposed that we do a study uh, experiment to show this. And so I built this, uh, the software for the system. Uh, we used a special box here on the left that was uh, a way of doing uh, uh, continuous input with your left hand. And we had the mouse device, which was a, a puck on a tablet in your right hand. So we designed uh, two different tasks. In the first one, you had to change the size of this box with your left hand and move it with your right hand to match the target. And in the second task, you had to scroll, which you could do with the left hand, and move back and forth, which you could do with the right hand. So the goal was to understand to what extent people would do this in parallel. And not too surprisingly, uh, a lot of people did. 41% of the people actually naturally did things in parallel, even though we didn't tell them they could or we didn't mention using two hands at the same time at all. 41% of the people did, and the people who did tend to be the fastest. So fastest to the left, and parallel is up. And so there's a very nice uh, correlation that we found. Another uh, paper I wrote during this time was in reaction to what I thought was uh, unclear uses of a bunch of terms. Uh, so I wrote this taxonomy that was accepted into uh, CHI in uh, 1986. Programming by example, uh, was being, I thought, misused. Uh, the idea is, a programming by example, is that when the system is actually trying to infer something, some AI based on the examples, uh, as opposed to programming with examples where there wasn't an AI. And similarly, uh, visual programming and program visualizations, now we kind of understand what those are, but at the time they were often used the same way. And I tried to emphasize that visual programming is when you write a program using graphics, and program visualization is where you try and understand a program using graphics, which are not necessarily the same thing at all. Uh, and the observation from this is uh, a good taxonomy or a survey can really be useful and a contribution in its own right. So to the extent that uh, you're trying to do the background for your PhD thesis, uh, it's often useful to take advantage of that uh, material. Of course, the main project I did at Toronto was my PhD dissertation on Peridot, which is an acronym for Programming by Example for Real-Time Interface Design Obviating Typing, and was the first system that showed uh, what we now call widgets could be created entirely by demonstration. And uh, you didn't need to do any conventional programming. All you did was draw pictures of what you wanted the graphics to do. And so uh, the system would then guess the relationships among the objects. So it would guess that the gray bar is the same size and embedded inside uh, the outside rectangle. 
And then uh, the second thing you could do is show how they move with uh, dynamically. So the, this is a scroll bar, so the indicator moves from the bottom to the top. And then a final step is you could show how things are interactive by just taking this little mouse icon and putting it on top of graphics, and that would say this graphic uh, moves with the mouse. Uh, so this uh, worked out really well. Um, Paradox could create all sorts of interfaces, uh, uh, menus, scroll bars, uh, button boxes, check marks, um, radio buttons, all these kind of things with a whole variety of different looks and feels. So looking back on uh, these old papers, it might be interesting to note that none of them had conventional evaluations like we're expecting to see today. There were not usability evaluations. We didn't have A versus B studies. Um, one advantage is if you are the first one to do something, then it's sufficient in your paper to just say it can be done. And I think uh, our uh, keynote speaker this morning was very much in that category. No one knew that stuff could be done. If you're the first to do it, uh, all you have to do is show that it's possible. Uh, most of the papers that we write these days involve showing something's better, and then obviously you need a more formal evaluation in order to uh, prove the difference or prove that your system is better, which requires more formal lab studies and so forth. Or else we want to show that something is good for only certain users, so not my non-programmers can use this device or whatever, and then you need studies to show that as well. So obviously the uh, bottom line is what you have to do in your paper in depends entirely on what you want to claim. Peridot uh, is also the gemstone for August, and that's when our first son was born. Um, he's actually uh, was born in Canada. Uh, we had planned uh, to wait until I finished and graduated before having kids, but I was talking to Ephraim Glinnert, who many of us know is now at the NSF. Uh, I was talking to him at a conference. He was uh, just had his first baby as a PhD student and was saying how much fun that was and how well that worked out. And since Ephraim is my role model, I figured I'd follow in his footsteps and do the same thing. Uh, and uh, uh, it actually worked out really well. Uh, an advantage of a PhD student compared to new faculties, you have a lot more flexibility uh, about when to go in and so forth. So I think it works out pretty well to have kids. Here's Ryan today. Well, not so much today. Here's Ryan with his. <laughs> His uh, three brothers, um, and then here he is today uh, at the far uh, next to me uh, with his three brothers and our uh, future daughter-in-law, which is coming up in the fall, so another reason that 2017 is a good year. This is a picture from last summer. After I graduated, I was recruited to go to Carnegie Mellon University, and I specifically remember the phone call from Mary Shaw, a famous faculty at CMU, inviting me to come to interview. I wasn't really planning to. Uh, my wife and I had just been out to Silicon Valley, and even way back in 1987, we were totally depressed and horrified at the price of housing out there. Uh, whereas in Pittsburgh, we bought a nice house, and we could afford to live on just my salary as a faculty member. Uh, and uh, that was nice, so Bernita could stay home with the kids. Uh, and I always tell this to prospective PhDs and faculty that we're trying to recruit that you should come to CMU and Pittsburgh because you can afford to buy a house even as a PhD student. Um, I started off as a research scientist at CMU, which was a, a very uh, a nice gig at the time because there was lots of money around and you could afford to do research full time. Uh, so I got to uh, do that and supervise grad students, uh, teach whenever I wanted. Um, my first project that was funded by uh, DARPA is called Garnet, uh, really a uh, significant project, uh, lasted a long time, stands for Generating an Amalgam of Real-Time Novel Editors and Toolkits. Uh, it turns out Garnet's the gemstone for January, which is my wife's birthday, so that worked out well. Um, Garnet was built in the Lisp programming environment, programming language, uh, which most people haven't used uh, in a long time. Uh, it's what we now call open source, although we didn't have that term at the time. Uh, it was freely available. And actually, I just saw a tweet this morning that somebody was saying they're still using open amulets, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and, and Lisp actually is also still being used because it's in Lisp, which is a dead language, so it's not changing at all. So, you know, if you write stuff in old languages, then it just keeps running. Garnet had lots of subparts, all of which have silly names and their own acronyms. Uh, lots of different innovations at the different levels. 
At the, low, at the low level, we had a prototype instance object system instead of the conventional class instance object system, uh, which is, uh, means that any object can be a prototype for others. And you see in the movie here that the, uh, as the prototypes on the left are changed, all of the instances on the right are changed as well. Um, and this is a property of the prototype instance system. And one thing we added in Garnet that hadn't been done before is what we called structural inheritance, where when you added new objects like the extra dots, uh, they were all automatically added to all of the subparts, all the children. Um, and this kind of object system is still in use. Uh, JavaScript actually has a prototype instance object system today. Another important feature of Garnet was the use of constraints. Uh, you can see that it's, uh, these objects are moved around, the lines stay attached. The idea of a constraint is you just declare these dependencies and the system maintains it. Um, Gar Garnet, everyone knew that you could use constraints for graphics like we're shown here, uh, but one of the things that we showed uh, in Garnet that was pretty novel was that it was also useful for keeping the data connected to each other. So uh, we now call it the model view controller, so keeping the model attached to the view using constraints was something we showed was important. <laughs> We also introduced this idea of pointer variables, which is where you could uh, connect things but not necessarily fill in right away which specific objects it was so that you could have that change at runtime. So for example, uh, the uh, selection handles are attached and the same size as whatever is selected, and then you just have to change the variable about what's selected. So these kinds of uh, constraints are still used for graphics in modern toolkits like in iOS. And they're also still used for this model uh, view connection in what we now call data bindings. Uh, the next uh, part uh, was this retained object model, which meant it did automatic refresh. You just had to change properties of things, and uh, that would happen. Uh, the refresh would happen automatically. And this is like what we now expect for the DOM in uh, web pages. You just change the DOM, and the web pages update automatically. Another important innovation was the way that Garnet handled input from the mouse and the keyboard. Um, we had these parameterized behavior objects that we called interactor objects, and uh, we showed that you could uh, create these objects and instantiate them at runtime with the right parameters, and that would handle all of the different kinds of behaviors that any kind of graphical interface needed. And so you never had to write event handlers, and you uh, could just put, you know, we figured out what parameters were needed so that these would be able to cover all the kinds of widgets you would want. And these concepts have been uh, adapted for many uh, modern uh, toolkits and systems like uh, Adobe Flash Catalyst was based on this directly. Uh, Garnet had lots of higher level tools. Uh, we, many of them were uh, interesting. Uh, Lapidary and Gilt were let users create interfaces just by drawing them. Agate was uh, a gesture recognition tool. Uh, Jade allowed you to create dialog boxes from an abstract model. And Marquise let you demonstrate uh, behaviors by example. Uh, but probably the Garnet tool with the most unusual acronym is C32, which I won't read. Um, <laughs> C32 is a spreadsheet interface for defining and debugging Garnet's constraints. A story about C32 is it started off as C29, when I submitted it to WIST and it got rejected. So I fixed a couple things, added three more Cs, and it uh, <laughs> flew through the CHI-91 referee process. Uh, James Landay, as a PhD thesis with me, was built in Garnet, was called Silk, and uh, James ended up with a whole series of cloth-based acronyms. Uh, the cool thing about uh, Silk is that you could draw examples, you could just sketch examples of the interfaces and then they would behave uh, so that uh, you could just go into run mode and see them actually operating. Uh, you could then press a button in the interface and it would transform the uh, widgets into a final looking user interface which you could then write the regular code in order to uh, um, finish uh, out the application. It also uh, introduced this idea of storyboards where you could draw the different screens you're interested. You could use uh, arrows to draw arrows from the different widgets that cause the other screens to appear. And then uh, you go into run mode and you could basically get what we now call a click-through prototype where you can see the uh, actual behaviors happening. 
Uh, while I've stayed at CMU for 30 years, James has been at Berkeley, NetRaker, the University of Washington, Intel, Tsinghua University, Cornell, and now he's at Stanford where he says he'll stay for a couple years. Uh, this shows the three of us at a, a Chi Award banquet uh, with three generations of being members of the Chi Academy, uh, Ron Becker, Bill Buxton, me, and uh, James Landay, uh, all members of the Chi Academy. I was still interested in this idea of programming by example, and so we built a bunch of systems using programming by example that weren't for interface building. Um, we did a system for text editing, a system for creating games. We also did file operations and web pages. Uh, one cool PVD system was called Gold, graphs and output laid out by demonstration, and you can see in the video, the idea of gold is you just drew pictures with a drawing editor of what you wanted your graphics to look like, and it would uh, then generalize those based on the data in the spreadsheet. And you didn't have to pick what kind of chart you wanted from a menu. You could just uh, draw examples. This worked for stacked bar charts, for paired bar charts, all sorts of different variations. Um, you could even do uh, pie charts. Um, if you change the color of things, it would notice that and use the colors as one of the encodings. It could do scatter plots. Uh, you could annotate things as the important values and uh, had lots of uh, cool features that would be really difficult to implement even today in something like Excel. Oh, and it, this is a two-dimensional bar chart, uh, which, I mean, a two-dimensional scatter plot which it can also handle. Another project I did, uh, I was the video chair for Chi90 before there was the internet where you could have videos. Uh, we had a video program as part of the conference and uh, people would submit videos. And I decided as a special project to do a video about uh, the history of widgets. Uh, I was really interested in how they had evolved over the years. Uh, and if you go back and look, at all the publications on things like Smalltalk, it never mentions how the scroll bars work because they didn't think that was important. But the scroll bars in Smalltalk actually work very different than what we're used to today. And so uh, this video shows like every different way a Smalltalk, I mean every different way any scroll bar worked, all the way up until 90, uh, menus, commands, uh, all sorts of different uh, ways. It's about two and a half hours long. It's now on YouTube and Vimeo and uh, it's a pretty useful resource if you're interested, and I'm very sad that nobody's done from 90 up till today because many things have changed. Um, I got interested in these kinds of history papers and did another, a couple of other history papers over the years that you can look up if you're interested. My next big project at CMU was called Amulet, which was very similar to Garnet, except that we switched to C++, and the acronym starts off differently. Um, DARPA, had, who was funding us, had correctly predicted that Lisp was kind of dead and not important anymore, and recommended that we switch to a more viable language like C++. Uh, Amulet had pretty much the same components as Garnet with a few interesting new parts. Uh, one of the key ones was an innovative use of command objects. Uh, so this is a way of executing uh, commands or operations, and uh, everyone knew that undo was important, but what we showed in the Topaz system is that it's really uh, useful also to have what we call selective undo. So instead of just going backwards, you could just specifically select specific uh, operations in the past and say undo only these and keep the rest of them the way they are. Um, and we also showed that once you could do that, you could generalize them into scripts or macros and then you could create all sorts of interesting transformations on your uh, graphics. My next big project was called Pebbles. Um, so a story about this is we started off calling it Palm Pilots for the entry and so forth. Uh, and then I got a nice grant from Microsoft. Uh, and so we had to generalize it to be uh, Palm Pilots, which is what these devices were called before they were smartphones. Um, and so the final acronym was uh, PDAs for the entry of both bytes and locations from external sources. Uh, PDA stands for Personal Digital Assistant, in case the young people don't know that. Uh, <laughs> the key premise of Pebbles was that we predicted way back in 1998 that a key use for mobile devices was going to be with uh, other computers and consumer electronics instead of as a replacement for other devices. 
And this, uh, I think, was pretty uh, prescient because at the time there was no wireless uh, and we had to use pretty awkward hardware like this, which you uh, could use to connect three different Palm Pilot, four different Palm Pilots to your PC. Um, eventually, of course, we did start using um, wireless. Uh, we were one of the first users of uh, what we now call Wi-Fi with the Waveland cards, and then eventually Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, so the uh, idea we had was to explore how you would use mobile devices with your PCs and um, consumer electronics in classrooms, in offices, in meeting rooms, and in homes. Um, we had a bunch of uh, different projects. Uh, we did a remote control uh, where you could use the handheld as a remote control for a PC, and this turned out to be useful for people with physical handicaps. Uh, we did a slideshow commander, which was my one exposure in commercialization, which uh, actually created off-the-shelf boxed software, which was on sale for almost six months before the dot-com bust. Bad timing. Uh, we did copy and paste across devices, which is still something you can't do uh, very easily, but we showed that it wasn't that hard. Uh, we went back to the two-handed uh, operation that I'd shown you before, but this time we could just use the Palm Pilot in your left hand. And uh, we also did uh, what I called semantic snarfing, which is where you use a laser pointer to point at the screen that captured the information, put it on your handheld, and you could operate on it uh, in your handheld. Uh, remember, this is 1998, um, which is long before this kind of thing now is pretty ubiquitous. And um, we also uh, created software in the Amulet Toolkit to support multiple streams of input with multiple cursors on the screen at the same time. Everybody could have their own cursor. Still something you don't get today. We showed that it wasn't that hard. One of the interesting application areas in Pebbles was for the military with the command post of the future project. Um, the interesting story about this is the director of the program from DARPA expected it to be about commanders talking and gesturing and using laser pointers in the command post. But it turned out that the key problem was situation awareness. And what we showed was that by putting the same thing that the commander was seeing on a handheld that the people in the field could have, uh, let the people in the field annotate and show what was going on, that this communication was really a lot more important than anything else we could do technologically. And this actually turned out to be really successful and was commercialized and apparently had a big role in the first Iraq war. Uh, the Personal Universal Controller was this cool project by Jeff Nichols, uh, his PhD in 2006. Um, the idea was to automatically create the remote control uh, user interfaces based on specifications of the capabilities of the uh, consumer electronic devices as well as the specification of the device that you're putting it on. So the uh, idea was to use rules from graphic design and uh, user interface design to try and uh, produce a high quality interface. And uh, we actually uh, took some real interface, real devices. These are two different printers, one from uh, Hewlett Packard and one from Canon. And we showed that uh, the Puck interface was actually twice as fast with one third the errors compared to the manually created consumer uh, electronics interface. So this was probably the first time that we automatically generated an interface and showed that it could be actually better than a manually created one. And then we had uh, another improvement, which is we call personally consistent, which is a real advantage of automatically generating these things, is that if you're familiar with one system, like one copier, and you go to another one, you might have trouble using it, or probably nobody used the alarm clock in their hotel room because you're worried you'll screw it up. Uh, but uh, so the idea of personally consistent interfaces is that any copy you go to will have a consistent interface with what you're used to because it could map the controls into whichever way you saw first. And we showed that this, in fact, increased the uh, speed and accuracy by another factor of two. Another cool project that was part of Pebbles was the EdgeWrite text entry method that Jake Wobrock developed for his PhD thesis. With edge right, you make the letters by moving along the edges and across the diagonal of a square. And Jake uh, showed that you could do this with a stylus on a PDA, but also with your finger on a touchpad or with a uh, joystick, with a, a 
uh, trackball, or even with the joystick that's the controller for a wheelchair. And the goal was to help physically handicapped people do text entry better, especially on mobile devices. Uh, a current project on mobile devices is um, Toby Lee's work on Sugalite, uh, which is actually an obscure gemstone. And uh, if you want to know what the acronym stands for, you'll have to go to his talk, uh, which is on uh, Thursday at 1130. Uh, the general idea is to do program by example on smartphones combined with a speech interface. So you can say to your phone, uh, buy me a cappuccino, and the phone will say, I don't know how to do that, and then you can demonstrate how to do it. And so you can come and see the details on Thursday. Uh, switching now to a different project, uh, I started the Natural Programming Project around 1995, and the goal of this is to make programming easier uh, by making it more natural. And by natural, I don't mean natural language like English, but rather closer to the way people are thinking about their programming tasks. Uh, and we uh, did a bunch of studies to understand how people are thinking about different kinds of tasks, uh, how programmers are uh, working, and we targeted a variety of kinds of programmers, uh, novice programmers, expert programmers, and a new category uh, that we uh, called end user programmers. Europeans call them end user developers. I'm not sure why there's this difference, but um, the, both of them are basically the idea that you are trying to uh, get something done and you're required to use programming. So programming is not something you want to do, it's something you have to do, and uh, therefore uh, you don't necessarily have a, a programming um, a degree. And uh, Chris Scafidi has showed that uh, there are about three million professional programmers compared to, depending on how you count, six million scientists, 13 million people who say they do programming at work, so that's already a factor of four more or as many as 90 million people if you count uh, all sorts of other ways of doing programming. I was uh, proud to be one of the founding members of the USIS Consortium that uh, focused on helping uh, end users do this more accurately in an area we uh, call end user software engineering. Why focus on studying programmers? Well, actually the HCI field started with programmers. Uh, here's a 1973 book on the psychology of computing programming and Ben's early book on software psychology. I don't know if we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, the basic idea is that all the original computer users pretty much had to be programmers. I was also inspired by this quote uh, from Alan Newell and Stu Card, some of the founders of the field, uh, that bemoan the fact that we are spending millions of dollars for compilers but hardly a penny for understanding human programming use. Uh, and it goes on to say that this should be a symmetric relationship because there are people on one side and the compiler on the other. Uh, but instead, the human and computer parts of programming languages have been developed in radical asymmetry. And so the goal of my work is to try and you know, do more on the human side and understand programmers as if they're people. Uh, so the observations that have come out of this work in general uh, is that often uh, programmers who are developing tools for programmers think they know what's going on, but are, we've shown many times that their intuitions are often wrong, and so it's really useful to actually do the studies and understand what real barriers programmers are facing. I like to also uh, use this gentle slope system idea as a way of explaining the point. Uh, so the vertical axis here is how hard it is to do something, and the horizontal axis is how much you can do. And if you think of Java, then it starts really hard. There's a lot you have to learn before you can write Java programs. And as you're going along, you suddenly realize it would be nice to do a GUI, graphical interfaces to handle input, and you have to stop and learn the whole swing toolkit, which is pretty hard. So we represent that as this vertical bar. Uh, and so obviously Java has a really high ceiling because you can do um, anything at all, but it might be nice to have a low threshold so it's easier to get started. And so uh, one thing, that has a low threshold is web development. So you can use Dreamweaver or equivalent or templates and make a web page pretty easily. But if you get more sophisticated, then you have to stop and learn CSS and HTML, which is a pretty big wall. And then eventually you'll have to learn JavaScript if you want it to be dynamic. And then eventually you'll have to learn server-side programming and database query languages. And I'm showing that as even harder than just starting off and doing it all in Java to begin with. And you can think about where all of the uh, languages that you like are on this graph. Um, 
But what we're really going for is uh, what I call a gentle slope system, which is where the intercept is really low, so it's really easy to get started. And for every new thing you want to do, it only requires a little bit of extra learning, and there are no walls, so you never get uh, blocked. And so this is a goal. Uh, it's not clear that you can even uh, achieve this goal, and so that brings me to the observation that it's useful to have a focus in a research on something uh, like making programming easier that uh, can never be uh, entirely solved, and the advantage of that is that you never run out of projects and uh, things to do. So the first big project that was the natural programming uh, was the hand system by John Payne in uh, 2002. And he started off with a whole bunch of new studies of how people express programming concepts. And we in invented a methodology we called the natural programming elicitation method, where we showed pictures to people and had them explain how they would tell the computer to do this. So Pac-Man sometimes goes like this and sometimes goes like this. And most kids said, about 75% of the kids said, when Pac-Man hits a wall, he stops which is a very event-based way of describing this, as opposed to a constraint-based way or some other way. Um, so uh, John used the results of these kinds of studies to design a new programming language for kids that um, he was able to show was uh, quite successful. Uh, Rob Miller's uh, PhD dissertation work was on Lapis, um, and the goal was to create an end-user understandable parsers that be, could be created by example. And important innovations in Lapis included the, uh, I think probably the first use of simultaneous editing, where when you edit in one place, it also edits in a bunch of places, which we're now used to seeing in IDEs when you change variable names. Um, he also had a cool way of visualizing outliers so that if you were uh, looking at potentially bad data or problematic patterns, it would uh, show those for you. Andy Coe's work with me ended up uh, with this important dissertation on the Y-Line, but along the way he built uh, all sorts of really interesting uh, systems and uh, did some studies uh, that showed a number of um, uh, important properties of programmers and uh, novices, identifying a number of barriers uh, that people have and uh, what uh, actually happens when experienced programmers do maintenance tasks. Uh, this is the Y line. Uh, he did it twice, uh, once for the Alice programming language for kids and another time for Java. And the general idea is that you could just point to some of the output that you're confused about and pop up a menu of why questions. So over here he's saying, why is this circle black? And the uh, system would then do a bunch of dynamic and static analyses to show you exactly what code was relevant uh, to, the, uh, to answer that question. And the... Uh, um, cool thing was that we were able to take this idea and not just apply it to uh, programming, but also to complex applications like uh, Microsoft Word or uh, any other complicated uh, application and uh, ask that why that uh, was doing something uh, confusing. And, uh, you know, so you might want to point to the uh, something that happens in Word and say, you know, why is this space here? Or why did you change these uh, letters? And uh, my wife is still saying, you know, why can't we have that uh, in today's applications? It would certainly be useful to know why Word and other programs are doing all these bizarre things. Uh, Thomas Atoza's work in 2012 uh, was to uh, answer uh, hard to answer, or to identify hard to answer questions about code. And he did a bunch of interesting studies at Microsoft and other places to find out what programmers were finding difficult. And an interesting result was that he identified hundreds of different questions, about 30% of which have never been addressed by any tool, either research or commercial. And for those of you looking for PhDs at the intersection of HCI and software engineering, uh, I have 30 for you. Um, but the particular question he was interested in was on control flow. Uh, which uh, he called reachability, and the idea is that in GUI programs, because of various patterns like the listener pattern, it can be really hard to understand the control flow. And so he developed this visualization that he showed uh, produces exactly the information that programmers needed and can help people uh, answer these kinds of questions much more effectively. 
Yun Suk Yoon's thesis was on backtracking during editing. I uh, graduated in 2005 with a system called Azurite. Um, so one of the key issues when you're programming is sometimes you want to undo things that you've done, and there's a undo command, but that turns out not to be particularly useful uh, for a lot of the things people want to undo. Uh, so most people end up just map modifying the code manually or adding in comments manually, which often is problematic. And in fact, uh, Yunsuk identified that this kind of thing happens as much as 10 times an hour during, uh, during programming tasks. And so the uh, tool that he built lets you uh, select a range of time or a range of code and do what's called selective undo that we talked about before. And this was the first system that ever showed that that would work for code. Uh, the system also has a way of searching backwards in time. So instead of just being able to say, uh, you know, search through code, which everybody knows is important, you could also search backwards in time. For example, when did I delete the grid bag layout method? Um, and so this was uh, a pretty interesting uh, capability. So the observations that come out of these projects include that uh, most people think of visualizations as a way of replacing looking at the code. Uh, visualizations of code, but in fact, we found that uh, visualizations are much more useful as navigation aids, that programmers really want to see the code, that's what they really care about, uh, but they often get lost. And so using the visualizations as a way of helping people know what code to look at turned out to be really critical. And search is also uh, something that, you know, with Google and so forth, everybody knows is really important, mm -hmm. but surprisingly seldom implemented in any situation other than plain text search. Whereas we showed that searching backwards across the control flow, searching backwards in time, uh, all these kinds of other more interesting searches are really useful. Uh, Jeff Stylus's PhD in 2009 started me on this uh, idea of API usability. APIs are application programming interfaces and they're libraries, frameworks, software development kits, and so on. Uh, nowadays, uh, it would be things like web services or middleware or APIs. And the idea is that uh, if you think of what these, uh, this code does, it's the interface between a programmer and a bunch of code. And so maybe we can use HCI techniques to understand how this interface works and how uh, current designs are decreasing usability. And sure enough, we showed that uh, certain software patterns that people were using well, made the code a lot worse. And uh, we could show how you could fix the APIs, or if that wasn't possible, at least we could provide new tools. And we created a whole uh, variety of tools to help programmers understand their APIs. Uh, for example, JDite showed a new way of providing Java docs, and the Cal site brought all of these tools into the Eclipse editor itself, into the Eclipse IDE. Um, uh, current work uh, in my group is, uh, Michael Koblen's PhD work where he's trying to make uh, programming languages easier to use for professional programmers. And he's done two different systems. Uh, the Glacier system he'll present at uh, ICSI in a couple of weeks uh, that helps programmers deal with immutability, things that can't change. And then he has a current project uh, called Obsidian, um, back to gemstones, where uh, he's dealing with blockchain programming. Uh, turning back to end user programming instead of professional programmers, uh, Stephen Oney's uh, work on interstate, uh, uh, graduated, he graduated in 2015, and this showed a very cool way to uh, combine spreadsheets and state transition diagrams to make it a lot easier for interaction developers to program uh, both GUIs and uh, various kinds of touchscreen interfaces. Another spreadsheet interfaces was Kerry Chang's PhD work uh, on NICE. NICE is a kind of rock. It's really cheap. Uh, you can get giant slabs of it for not very much money. Um, the uh, cool thing about NICE is it was uh, to deal with web service data, which is hierarchical, which doesn't necessarily fit really well with uh, spreadsheets, uh, which are tables. And so uh, Kerry came up with a very cool way of mapping uh, hierarchical data into a spreadsheet, and then to use that data uh, for web applications, uh, might be for a mobile device or for uh, regular uh, computers. And uh, that brings us up to the present for Mary Beth Carey's work on understanding and better supporting exploratory programming. Uh, what exploratory programming means that the user is writing code as a way of understanding a problem. Um, 
to prototype and experiment with different ideas. Uh, and the goal of the program develops as part of the programming process. It's not necessarily defined in advance. Vari Varialite uh, provides a bunch of lightweight features to make it easier for the programmer to try out different code, uh, to keep track of all previous versions, and uh, a bunch of other things that you'll have to come to her talk to find out about. That's on Tuesday. Uh, and also, she'll tell you what the acronym stands for. Whoops. Uh, where was I? Sorry. Yep. Uh, so the observations, uh, in somewhat more general, uh, based on this 40 years of work, and there are lots of other projects I didn't have time to cover that um, I invite you to go look at as well. Um, number one, always make a video. Uh, everyone's uh, tempted to just do a live demo, which works fine for a month or two, but in 40 years, your live demo will probably not work. Uh, whereas it's always uh, fun, and I was just very sad for some of the systems that we didn't have videos for them. Um, it's also really nice and kind of fun to have a group culture with uh, things like the ribbons or the acronyms or gemstones, even if some of the students don't want to adhere to it, that's fine. <laughs> um, and then uh, I've always found that uh, it's always a lot of uh, work and expense to go to conferences, but if you just get one good idea, it makes the whole thing worthwhile. Uh, so um, I really uh, always love to go to conferences and uh, read articles. It's the same idea. If you can get one worthwhile idea, then it uh, makes it all possible, makes it all fun. So now I'm going to switch into the Academy Award mode and, and thank people. I want to obviously start off by thanking all the funding agencies. Uh, started off with Xerox PARC and the U of T fellowships. Uh, and at CMU, it's been uh, DARPA and NSF, uh, NIH, and a bunch of companies, Microsoft, SAP, Google, Adobe, IBM, Apple, and many others. Obviously, I want to thank my wife and family for their continuous support, uh, my mentors and colleagues, and especially my hundreds of students. Uh, I've had uh, at least 200, maybe 300 uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD students just doing research with me, not counting the ones that uh, have been in my classes. Uh, the coolest thing about being a professor, I think, is getting to work with so many excellent and talented students, especially my 16 PhD students, and I especially want to thank them. Um, sometimes uh, a PhD student will follow in your footsteps and become faculty themselves, and uh, this is the full tree of all 172. I heard just a few minutes ago it's 173 now. Um, so the first line is my students and their students and their students and so on, all the way down six generations along the longest path. Um, and you can identify people on the tree because they'll have this ribbon that shows uh, where they are. Uh, and if you happen to be on this tree and you don't have a ribbon yet, then you can come up and get one. I have a big pile here. With a lifetime achievement kind of reward, uh, everyone always asks if I'm done. And I'm happy to say no, that I'm really still having a lot of fun. I have current students and hopefully picking up some more in the fall. Uh, hopefully have many more people on this tree, both directly as my advisees, as well as everybody else's over many years. So I want to thank them uh, very much for their creativity and their productivity. Uh, and also, of course, um, there's the ribbon and thank all of you for listening. <laughs>
And the answer is almost never. Uh, but occasionally it's happened. So I was uh, actually hired as a consultant to Adobe when they were coming out with one of these products. And they specifically said they wanted to uh, reproduce some of these ideas in a toolkit. Uh, I was told by, I think it was Robert Jeffries' uh -huh. son, that they had put a feature into their system because of uh, something she had heard from me. So it happens rarely. Um, it's certainly one of the things about being a faculty member as opposed to uh, working in a company is you have to be willing to accept this very indirect long-term uh, influence uh, rather than actually being able to uh, do it directly. So uh, sometimes I feel like we've done things that are practical and ready to go uh, and wish that somebody would take them up right away, but um, that doesn't happen very often. Congratulations, Brad. Um, I've got a question which is kind of semi-serious, um, <laughs> but I want to uh, ask it because I see that you've obviously uh, got your Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Bob Kraut was, is here. He has won two. Ben Schneiderman is here. He has won two. What do you think makes the three of you similar? And what do you think makes... <laughs> And what do you think makes the three of you different? I mean, there are lots of young people here who may want to get a Lifetime Achievement Award. So that's my question. Um, well, we all have gray hair. And <laughs> uh, certainly, uh, I'm very uh, gratified to be in their company and to be uh, associated with the kind of uh, contributions that uh, we've all made. I think. Uh, a lot of it comes down to having lots of good ideas and uh, great students to uh, carry them out recently. Uh, plenty of time to carry them out when I was younger when I could do them myself. Uh, the uh, other thing, you know, it's important to have uh, ambition and drive and, you know, want to keep going. It's kind of a characteristic of CMU is that we uh, have a very, uh, I guess, aggressive or uh, active culture of uh, working hard and trying to uh, produce a lot of things, and I try to instill that in my students. Uh, so we're always trying to uh, produce new ideas and uh, keep going, um, as opposed to some of my colleagues, nobody in the room, uh, who uh, decided they could just relax after they got tenure. It's certainly not our culture at all. Hi, I'm Elena Glassman. Um, I had the pleasure of being advised by one of your advisees. And um, I actually did not realize until you gave this talk how deep and how long you've been doing programming with examples, by examples, by demonstration. Um, and I'm curious, uh, as someone, uh, you know, uh, what, is, what do you find most exciting? You're, you're still doing systems like that now, right? Um, what do you think are the most exciting challenges in that particular paradigm mm -hmm. going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, programming by example uh, is one of the many approaches that we've been experimenting with for many years to try and make programming easier. And uh, we definitely have had some uh, global observations that I probably could have put in the talk. Uh, one is that um, the kind of general idea is that end users or non-programmers are good at coming up with examples. Because if you ask somebody on the street you know, to tell you uh, how something works, they'll give you an example. We've, sh we've uh, seen over and over again that people are really not very good at giving examples. That uh, they can give you one example, but if you want to try and cover a space like a program has to, all of the error examples will be in exactly the same spot. And whereas a programmer will know how to give programmers, will give examples that fill the space. Uh, so that's one thing. You can't assume that people are going to give you good examples. Uh, Another uh, current work that Toby's doing uh, that we're excited about for the future is we're collaborating with some AI faculty. It seems like if you let people speak in natural language, they do a better job of explaining the generalizations. So the hard part of programming by example is that you often don't want it to work only for the concrete exactly the same one that you demonstrated, but it's to work for everything in the space. How do you generalize the examples to everywhere? And it seems like people are pretty good at explaining that in English. And so we're collaborating with some AI faculty to see if we can get the machine learning uh, to 
take advantage of that. Uh, so I guess, oh, and the third thing uh, that's definitely always a problem is uh, most programming by example systems assume you always start from scratch, that you have a blank s space and you give an example and that starts the process, uh, whereas all real systems, real programming involve editing and maintenance and changing what you have before into something new. And most programming by example systems have no static representation of what the code is or what the system does. And that makes it really hard to go back and say, this part is wrong now, and I want to do something new from there. Uh, so that's an, uh, another really important aspect, to have some kind of static representation to enable better editing and maintenance. Also debugging. James Landay uh, from Stanford currently. <laughs> <laughs> um, congratulations. It was really great to see all this stuff. Um, Related to this question, um, from the early days of seeing your work in programming by demonstration, by example, um, the related work was always hard to say, how do you visualize the under underlying representation? And if you can't edit it and do something with it, it's hard to do anything. Right now, the big thing going on in computing is uh, machine learning using really big data. And we're running into this problem again. And I'm wondering, from all of these uh, you know, 100 systems or so you've done, there's probably 30 in programming by example and demonstration, visualization of code, wireline, all these things. Are there any ideas that you can think of w that we should take from that area to help with understanding uh, uh, the uh, systems that are inferred from big data? Yeah, I haven't personally done work in that area. Uh, I know Andy Coe has worked on that a little bit, so I can give a call out to one of my former students. Um, and. Uh, I don't think I really have any good thoughts on that. Uh, obviously a really hard problem. You want to have um, <clears throat> some kind of understandable uh, representation so people are confident about the uh, models that have been inferred. <clears throat> you want to have some way for uh, even professional programmers to debug those systems, uh, to know what to do in order to improve them when they're not uh, doing the right thing. And, I think this really needs to be a key focus, uh, which I don't see happening with most of the AI and machine learning people that I collaborate with, that uh, it definitely is uh, an area that warrants a lot more research in how to have either visualizations or static representations of the learned uh, methods in order to uh, support debugging and testing and changes, but I don't think I personally have any good insights. Isan Hawk, University of Rochester. So uh, we cannot imagine computing without progress bar today. So when you were a grad student running that experiment, introducing the idea of progress bar, did you have a hunch that one day it's going to go viral? Uh, in other words, how do you know you're onto something? Well, I didn't invent progress bars. They actually existed way back with the original computers, uh, like the teletype machines. Uh, the ball would pop up and make a little noise every now and then when the program was running. And there always had been progress bars for like FTP programs that had a very clear beginning and end. Uh, the uh, problem was that they were very rarely used. It was just for file transfers or things that basically would lock up the computer and have uh, 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 a very clear way of computing uh, how far along you were and, and so forth. Uh, and so what I had uh, the insight was that uh, people wanted these everywhere. They didn't just want them for these particular tasks. And that almost every time there was a Buddha or a watch that wasn't doing anything, at least you should be able to show the person whether the computer was crashed, which happened a lot in those days, versus uh, uh, actually still making progress. And uh, it was often, and one of the things I showed in this paper was that it was often useful to have an estimate and show people how well they were doing, uh, even if you couldn't be 100% accurate. And so that was kind of the, uh, the key contribution that we should be using this in a more widespread way, uh, rather than like inventing it. But more to your point, you know, kind of similar to what Bob was asking, uh, you never really know what wor work you do is going to catch on. Uh, basically, we all write papers in hopes that people will take our cool ideas and do good stuff with them. Um, but um, 
you know, I don't really have any insight in how to make that happen versus uh, uh, other things that we've done that, like, I thought the gold idea on the making bar charts, by example, was really cool, but nobody was interested, so it's hard to tell. Uh, hi, uh, Brian Hall, um, yeah, soon to be University of Michigan. Um, and I wonder, um, so obviously you've had an extraordinary career of 40 years so far, and I'm sure you've seen a tremendous amount of, of fads come and go, and things have changed, and some things have stayed the same. Um, and I wonder specifically for those of us that are sort of starting out in our careers and looking maybe towards an academic path, um, has the advice that you were given that you thought was good advice when you were coming out as a faculty member has some of that advice fundamentally changed with the advice that you have to give young students now going into the system? Um, well, I think there are ways to uh, adapt most of the advice for modern, uh, modern uh, technologies. So, you know, we used to produce tech reports a lot, which nobody does anymore, but people still put their uh, research up on the web in a different way. Uh, my group always had, had a strong uh, culture of writing papers, uh, which uh, we also had in Toronto. Ben, move over. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there were uh, plenty of uh, things I learned at Toronto, uh, having uh, good science behind your, um, and psychology to motivate uh, the kind of research topics that we were doing. Um, we uh, definitely have applied in lots of different uh, situations. Um, so um, I'm trying to think of something that's obsolete uh, besides the computers that we used and the languages. Uh, in terms of ideas and advice, I think it's surprisingly robust. Uh, write lots of papers, uh, have good science behind your systems, and uh, try to do systems that are impactful. Hi, I'm Ben Peterson from University of Maryland. Congratulations again, Brad. Thanks. So first, just a really quick comment in response to uh, Bob's question about looking at your impact. I suspect if you did a patent and trademark office search <laughs> of patents that were assigned to other companies that mentioned your name, uh, you would find quite a lot and do that company by company. It might be an interesting little exercise uh, to try and have one simple um, measure of that kind of impact. And your name is unique enough, you might find something. Okay. If you Thanks. haven't already. No, I haven't done that. <laughs> Um, my question is, uh, you expressed having one of your approaches to doing research is by uh, having a lot of good ideas. Uh, and no doubt you do have a lot of good ideas. You also work with stakeholders and try to identify um, kind of problems that other people have. And certainly sort of the HCI uh, mindset is often to work with others to understand their authentic problems and then come at their problems with your solutions. Of course, the answer is going to be there's a variation of a bit of both, but if you were to give advice to people, how would you suggest people balance scratching your own itch versus, I'm not going to say that, helping, <laughs> other, <laughs> helping other people solve their problems? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, usually uh, when we have an idea of something that we want to look into, um, Nowadays, it's usually really useful to uh, quantify uh, how big a problem this is for other people. Uh, so often, it's really useful to do the studies anyway. Um, you know, how often do, uh, so for example, with uh, Mary Beth's work on exploratory programming, um, we've been working on that for years. I've always thought that was a great way to do programming. Um, but we still went out and did the study to show that you know, this is true for lots of other people too, and uh, the different uh, perspectives help you build a system that has more interesting features that address what different kinds of people need. Uh, so, um, occasionally we've built systems just based on our own intuitions, and sometimes it's worked out really well, and sometimes I had one system I didn't show you called Appetite that was just a complete flop. Uh, we thought it'd be cool to be able to look at documentation, associatively, so all modern documentation kind of is a top-down, so we were trying to provide a sideways way into documentation where you could say, what other methods are associated with this method? Or what other classes do people usually use at the same time as this class? So we thought that would be really cool, and uh, sure enough, we built it, and 
made it work really well and nobody could think of anything to do with it. So um, we had no uh, outside research to help understand why that might be applied and sure enough, it didn't work out in practice. So I still, I still think it's really useful to um, have uh, either other people's uh, documented research, sometimes you can just find this in papers, um, or other people's complaining about something to know that this is an important and uh, usefully hard problem. Jason Weezy from the University of Utah. Uh, congratulations, it was fan fantastic to see all of the history. Uh, so my question is about uh, your advising. Uh, so obviously uh, the success of all of your advisees can be attributed in some part to you because you have helped molded uh, so many of us. Thanks. And so what I want to know is if you have any insights to share about um, advising after you have successfully advised so many students in HCI, if you have any uh, tips to share with those of us who are starting out. Sure. Um, always happy to talk about that. Um, number one is to be at a great school where all the students are superior. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, I found one of my strengths is not necessarily interviewing, so I'm really grateful to be at a place where somebody else's committee picks the students that are going to work with me. Uh, so uh, obviously having great students uh, is the first criteria. Uh, but we definitely have a culture in my group that uh, seems to foster uh, successful students. Uh, number one is I focus a lot on writing. Uh, so I try and get my students to write papers at least twice a year. And frankly, some of my advisees were not very good writers to start with. Um, and uh, that's sometimes a real struggle, but it's always really important. I think whether you go to industry or academia, that being able to coherently take your ideas, and it's not just the mechanics of writing on paper, but having an understanding of how to have a coherent idea and the elevators you know, how to write the abstract so that it's really clear what your idea is, how to have a crisp description of what's going on. Uh, so those are uh, obviously key uh, parts of uh, the work. Um, and then to, uh, you know, try to focus on ideas that, number one, are interesting, and number two, you have an idea about how to solve, right? So uh, you try to match those up and uh, understanding the area, you know, the prior work, uh, really helps uh, place your work so that you can uh, identify what's really different about what you're working on compared to everybody else. But. Okay, so uh, we've reached the end of the session. I'm told we really have to stop on time and that's what I said 10 seconds from now. Okay. So, we want a big hand. Thanks. Thanks.